So hey, why don't you all stand to your feet? We're going to go into the reading of the word. Before I do, I just want to say next week we're starting our Revelation series. And so if that interests you, if you're excited about that, then make sure you're here, here and a part of that and uh, tell friends that might be interested in that. But we're going to start a journey through Revelation and uh, we're calling it Apocalypse. Uh, I, don't, we, I guess we don't have the graphic for that, but it's called Apocalypse. A journey through Revelation. So that's our next Sunday. Super excited about that. For the last six months, or sorry, six weeks, we've been going back and forth, if you'll notice, between kingdom first and love different. And so today you have the exciting conclusion of love different. And Pastor Amy's going to bring the word today. I was super excited. It's a really good, really good word that God gave her. And it's fun to have her back because it's been a while since she preached on a Sunday because she was kind of preaching to teenagers and doing youth ministry thing and, and uh, did that. So now is excited to have her on a Sunday morning. To conclude our Love Different series, here is the passage I want to read to us. It's the love chapter. If you know what the love chapter is, it's 1 Corinthians 13. This is from the, the Passion Translation. Listen to this. If I were to speak with eloquence in earth's many languages and in the heavenly tongues of angels, yet I didn't express myself with love, my words would be reduced to the hollow sound of nothing more than a clanging cymbal. And if I were to have the gift of prophecy with the profound understanding of God's hidden secrets, and if I possessed unending supernatural knowledge, and if I had the greatest gift of faith that could move mountains but never, have never learned to love, then I am nothing. And if I were to be so generous as to give away everything I own to feed the poor and to offer my body to be burned as a martyr without the pure motive of love, I would gain nothing of value. Love is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. It refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Love does not brag about one's achievements nor inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect, nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter, for it never stops believing the best for others. Love never takes failure as defeat, for it never gives up. Love never stops loving. It extends beyond the gift of prophecy, which eventually fades away. It is more enduring than tongues, which will one day fall silent. Love remains long after words of knowledge are forgotten. Our present knowledge and our prophecies are but partial, but when love's perfection arrives, the partial will fade away. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Um, I love how that ends because... You know, for us at Rivers Church, we believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he died on the cross, and that he rose again. But we do believe that he's returning for his bride, the church. And that is what the end of that scripture speaks to. So it's, it's really perfect, leading us right into Revelations. Um, and Tyrone, I'm like, I almost gave away some of his sermon. You guys have to come next week and find out what apocalypse really means, because it doesn't mean what you think it does. So, so glad you guys are here. As Tyrone mentioned, my name is Amy. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm so grateful to be here with you. Um, I don't know about you, but we are in the middle of a pandemic but this pandemic comes with an epidemic, and that epidemic, unfortunately, is not love. I wish that it was. This epidemic I like to affectionately call the know-it-all epidemic. It is an epidemic of unsolicited opinions, advice, right? Have you had this? Have you seen this happen before? Um, never have I gotten so much advice than this season of my life. Actually, I take that back. When I was pregnant, I got a lot of advice. And if you are in here and you've been pregnant, you know what I'm talking about. It's like that giant belly is like a billboard sign that says, come and tell me all that you've experienced in life and, and how I need to do this motherhood thing right. Um, and so I actually had a giant belly when I was pregnant, if you can imagine. And I used to not look pregnant from behind. And so when I would walk around in different stores and turn to the 
side, I would literally hear massive gasping from the people behind me <laughs> because it would be like literally like I was turning the ship, you know? <laughs> it was like just swinging the belly back and forth. Um, I actually was about three weeks late with Jude, my first child, and so that meant... Um, I mean, like I said, I, people would follow me around with advice, but I was three weeks late, which meant that Sunday was coming and I didn't have a shirt to cover my belly because I didn't have my baby yet. <laughs> I had not a single shirt. And so we had to go to this one store. There's one store that carried maternity shirts in all of Chehalis, Washington. And Tyrone takes me there on a Saturday and I'm walking into the store. I actually found only one shirt that would cover my entire belly because like half of my belly hung out on the bottom. Um, and I went into the dressing room to try that one shirt on. It was an extra large maternity shirt. You guys, I usually wear smalls. It was an extra large maternity shirt. I get into the dressing room and lo and behold, a woman follows me into the dressing room to give me advice. Super violating, I'm just going to say. And she proceeds to tell me how I could make this baby come quicker. Her advice did not work. I'm just saying I had five more days to go. Um, and it turns out that the only help I need is Pitocin. I cannot give birth naturally without that. If you're a man in here, I'm sorry. Yes, Pitocin causes you to have babies. Um, but I, that did not end with advice because I then get pregnant again with Jaden. And people are following me around because I carried my babies low. And they're like, oh, that's a boy. You, I can tell that is going to be a boy. I'm like, dude, I got the ultrasound. I'm like eight months pregnant. This is a girl. And she came out as a girl. But, man, the conversations I would have, women, you know what I'm talking about. You're just trying to get out of the conversation because you're like, I don't even know you. I'm just bringing my son to Great Wolf Lodge because he's crazy and three and I'm eight months pregnant. So give me a break. Congratulations, this season, in this whole pandemic, I can say you all have experienced what it's like to be pregnant. <laughs> Even if you're a man, you know what it's like to be pregnant now. It's unsolicited, unsolicited advice coming at you, coming at you, coming at you. And then, not to mention after you have the baby. And it doesn't matter, man, if you've given birth, um, if you've given birth to a baby or if you just have adopted a child. I don't, I don't care if you're raising your grandchildren. People come at you with advice when they see that child in your arms. And this happened just a couple months ago. I got to witness this happening to a young mom with a newborn baby as I watched an elderly lady walk up to her and tell her how dare she bring that baby into the store. Does she know what she's doing and that her baby could die? Again, I don't care. You mamas, whether you're a mama from having a baby or you adopted a child, you know what your greatest fear is. You're afraid of that child dying from the moment of that child coming into your life. You don't need no one giving you advice on how that child could die. And I'm telling you, oh, man, when I heard that, I just wanted to pull my pants up and go over to her and backhand her. You know what I'm talking about? I wanted to tell that woman to stop what she was doing. Uh, the Holy Spirit came in me and helped me to hold my tongue. And I later ran into the mom, and I just said, hey, you're doing a great job. You're a great mom, and not everybody is judging you in this store. But, man, advice, you guys. Why do people feel like they need to give it? Why did that woman feel like she needed to walk up to that poor young mom who's just barely making it with a cup of coffee and a mom bun and tell her how bad she's doing? It's because we like to feel right. People like to feel right. It comes down to control, right? It makes us feel like we're able to control some things. We feel superior. People can feel like they're more important. They have greater knowledge. They have something they need to share to you that you need to know is what it comes down to. But why do we get so much advice in this season? Have you thought about that? Like, why is so much advice going around? Like, I get an email to me. I get a link sent to me. And I... I, I'm just going to give you the truth, and you might not like it. Do you think you can handle it this morning? The truth is we're all given the advice. You and me, we're given the advice. That's why everywhere we go, we get advice, because we're the ones doing it. We are given all this advice. We're giving it out because we believe that we have knowledge that somebody doesn't have that they need to have. Like I watched a video on YouTube or on the internet and now all of a sudden I am an, ex I'm an expert on this and I got to let you know what I know. I got to help you out because I love you. I need to share this. And the truth is that what's happening is we're becoming the annoying aunt at the baby shower. 
And excuse me, Karen, this is a, a funny word, that, but it, your name is nice. But we've all become Karens, you know? We've all become that person that needs to tell them how to fix something, right? Let me share this article. Let me share this video. It's because I love you. In the name of love. Okay, all the millennials are like, it went over their head. But you can look up that song. But let me tell you, it is not in the name of love. Because knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Even incorrect knowledge puffs up, unfortunately. And we're so busy trying to change someone's mind that we fail to minister and to love the heart. I want you to think about this for a minute, this question. Is it better to be right or is it better to have a right heart? And what is the difference? See, loving different means loving without elevating oneself. It is really loving without an agenda. But honestly, is it loving if I'm annoyed, arguing, and bullying someone? If I'm angry about someone's choice? And boy, do I know this. Because sometimes people make decisions that I just obsess about. And I'm like, dude, they should not be doing that. That is not a good idea. That is going to hurt their kid. And if... I find myself getting angry and obsessing over someone's decisions, values, or offended by them. Is my motive in correcting them really love? Or is it something else? It could be fear. It could be control. It could be pride. It could be judgment. And I think we're seeing this, like, on a super increased level in this season. And I wish, church that I wasn't needing to talk to you about this because the truth is the church should love different. And the problem is that this has come into the church and that instead of going out with the love of Jesus, we're going out with fear, control, pride, and judgment, and we don't look different than the world. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, I'm reading it in the TPT. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm just super obsessed with the TPT right now. And I should tell you guys that this message was really for me. I didn't write this message for you. I woke up at 6 in the morning. I had read a scripture um, similar to the one that I'm about to read to you. And the Lord just convicted my heart. And I just began to write what he was speaking to me. So as you hear this, I don't want you to hear this from the position of somebody who's got it all down. Who's letting you know how it should be. Just another good Karen here telling you how you should live your life. No, this was for me. It just happened that Tyrone asked me to speak, and this is what God gave me for me. So I thought maybe you might get something out of it too. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 in the TPT. There are six evils God truly hates. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you, if you want to grow, you need to know what he hates to stay away from it. A servant, uh, and the seventh, that is an abomination to him. Putting others down while considering yourself superior. And that is what the NIV calls haughty eyes. Spreading lies and rumors, spilling the blood of the innocent, plotting evil in your heart towards another, gloating over doing what's plainly wrong, spouting lies in false testimony, and stirring up strife between friends. One day I'm going to explore that scripture right there because that's a big one too. These are entirely despicable to God despicable to God. As I said, the NIV calls it haughty eyes. And the, and the word haughty um, is really comes from the French haute, which means to be high up, or the Latin, which is alt, which means altitude. Um, but what is it? What is a haughty spirit? And maybe you've read this before, and you're like me, and you haven't been raised in church, and you're like, Um, There's a lot of words I'm still learning, and that was one of them. A haughty spirit is this. Haughty eyes or a haughty spirit is the kind of eyes that look down on people as if one is looking down is higher than the other. Let me reread that. Haughty eyes are the kind of eyes that look down at people as if the one looking down is higher than the others. Higher in knowledge, higher in understanding, higher in righteousness, higher in morality, higher in experience. You fill in the blank. Anytime we feel higher and we're looking down, that is haughty eyes. Proverbs 16, 18, and 19 in the, in the NIV version says it this way. Pride comes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. But to the lowly in spirit, but to the lowly in spirit along with the oppressed, 
Then the, oh wait, ah, I don't know why I'm reading that wrong. You guys, can I have a do-over? Okay, I'm going to do over. Proverbs 16, 18 through 19. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Let's see if I can do this. Better to be lowly in spirit along with the oppressed than to share the plunder of the proud. And what is the plunder? Man, I don't know about you, but that's where I go to. I'm like, what's the plunder? It doesn't seem like a physical thing. The plunder is someone else's values. It's the feeling we get when we are right and someone else is wrong. It is taking pleasure in our rightness at the expense of someone else. That is the plunder. And like I said, this sermon wasn't written for you. It was written for me. And if I'm being honest, the more I explore this haughty spirit, the more I see it in me the more I notice that my motive in sending that link was more about being right than it was about helping someone else. And I'm going to tell you right now, like, I kind of maybe had a haughty spirit this weekend with Tyrone because it doesn't just happen outside our homes. Sometimes it happens in our homes. And it's just so much easier, right, to recognize this stuff in someone else. It's like, oh, that's a haughty spirit. And God's like, I want you to recognize it in you, not in other people. And so what's the cure to a haughty spirit? I've got three things I want to share with you, three exercises that can dispel a haughty spirit in yourself and in, your, in the atmosphere, really. It really just breaks it up. And the first one is listen and love. Second is feed their faith. The third is let the Holy Spirit do his job. So we're going to dive right in with the first one, which is listen and love. Listen with your heart not your head. And there's another song right there. Listen to your heart, right? Can you sing it? Who can sing it? Okay, that's a good one. So take time to listen to the person. Like maybe stop talking and listen to what's really going on because I'm going to tell you right now, their opinion is not their identity. Their value, their political party is not who they are. You know who they are? They're a child of God. Made in the image of God. That's who they are first. And so we need to take the time to find out why and how did they develop this value, this opinion. What influenced them? What experiences they have that I don't know about that brought them to this value? And maybe if we go there first, we're going to get a lot further. And we need to not listen with the goal to debate I mean, I know none of you in here do this, but you're like building your case in your mind. You're not really listening. You're just thinking about what you're going to say next, right? But we need to listen for what's driving them. What emotion is driving this value or this attitude or this action or what they're posting? What is behind that? But can I caution you, when we do speak, one of the things that we need to do is we need to speak um, in such a way to seek to understand. That is going to involve questions, my friend. And never did anybody in all of history do that better than Jesus, right? He even answered questions with a question. He was just dang good at it. He was like sly. So I'm going to give you a few questions you could ask. Sounds like you're passionate about this. Tell me what your experience is. Why does this scare you? And man, I'm going to tell you right now, these are like some deep questions. And I have asked people these questions. I've watched them break down in tears in front of me. And it just totally changes the whole atmosphere when you start asking these questions. Do you feel a loss of control? Maybe that's more of a COVID question. You sound angry. What's making you angry? You see, we can't change a mind if we don't touch a heart. And if we're so busy trying to change minds that we don't see the heart, we're kind of like missing out on a whole lot of maybe what God wants to do in us and also through us. We have to ask ourselves, why am I afraid to listen to their values or opinions? What am I so scared of? Like, is my faith so weak that I feel like their lack of faith could destroy me? Because I tell you what, God ain't, he don't need no defending. His truth is true whether you believe it's true or not. But do you believe that? Enough that you don't need to defend God. He can defend himself. Listening and loving will help us also to live in a place of joy 
and freedom and peace rather to live than live in a place of anxiety and strife and trying to control people. Let me tell you, this is enough to control right here. If I start trying to control you, dude, it's over. I'm like, peace out. I'm already trying to control my mini-me's, and they are not mini-me's. They're more like bigger than me's that are like toddlers with adult bodies. I'm trying to manage them. It's so hard. But why would, no wonder we have this epidemic also of anxiety. I'm not just trying to control me. I'm trying to control you. That is stressful. Let's let that go. We'll have a whole lot less relational and emotional strife if we listen and we love first. Now, not everything's going to be taken care of because like a, relationally and relational strife with that because you know and I know you've got crazies in your life that you can't control and they're just crazy and that's okay. We all have them in our family. Some of them, we are the crazy in our family, but most of our relational strife is self-inflicted. We're causing the problem. Listening before we speak could really help us. And James, who is the brother of Jesus, has great advice in this because James didn't even believe in Jesus till after his brother died and rose again. I'm sure James felt very guilty of the things he said to Jesus. And so this is what James says, the brother of Jesus in James 1, 19 through 20. This is the TPT version as well. My dearest brothers and sisters, take this to heart. Be quick to listen and slow to speak and be slow to become angry for human anger is never a legitimate tool to promote God's righteous purpose. Can I say it again? Human anger is never a legitimate tool to promote God's righteous purpose. You want to know what else that we miss out on hearing when we don't listen? The Holy Spirit. We cannot hear the Holy Spirit when all I hear is my thoughts and the things I want to say. And without hearing the Holy Spirit, we definitely cannot do number two, which is feed their faith rather than fight their opinion or their values. And this is going to require some compassion, empathy, um, humility, and some self-control. Some of the fruit of the Spirit is in there. Um, But it is so important. Um, I want to read to you Philippians 2, which is one of my most favorite chapters in all of Scripture. Uh, Philippians 2, 1 through, or 3 through 5. And this is TPT 2. Be free from pride-filled opinion, for they will only harm your cherished unity. Can I just say church? Be free from pride-filled opinion. It will only harm your cherished unity. Don't allow self-promotion to hide in your heart, but in authentic humility, put others first and view others as more important than yourself. Abandon every display of selfishness. Possess a greater concern for what matters to others instead of your own interests. And consider the example that Jesus, the anointed one, has set before us. Let his mindset become our motivation. You've maybe heard this before, but you got two buckets. When somebody's like angry or you're in the middle of like strife and it's like their fire or their body's on fire with like anger, you got two buckets, right? You got water and you got oil. And you know, if you pour the oil on it, what's that going to do? explode the fire and make them angry. But you want to pour water on it, and you want to dispel that anger. You want to put it out. I'm going to put this analogy in a little bit of a different way than maybe you've thought about it, um, because we're talking about feeding someone's faith. And no matter where people are in their journey with Jesus, there is still a spark in there. So I want you to imagine that fire is actually their faith. And some people, their fire is burning bright. And some people, it's just a small spark or a little ember. And you have two buckets. You have one of water and you have one of oil, which I would say would be feeding their faith. And you can choose to put their faith out with your water or you can choose to fuel it with some oil. And the oil has always represented the Holy Spirit. And now, I've mentioned this before, but, like, I wasn't raised in church. There's all kinds of church words that get used that I'm still figuring out that's like, oh, that's what that means. Because I didn't grow up 
in church. Like, I was 15 when I got saved. And one of those words is quenching the spirit. Quenching the spirit. What does it mean to put the spirit's fire out is kind of what it means. And it's often because, like, we relate this a lot in church. We're like, oh, that pastor put the spirit out. Oh, that worship leader. But we don't realize that every single day we've got two buckets, and we're either putting someone's faith out or we're fueling it in every conversation that we have. And it's scary, right? Because you're like, whoa, I could be quenching the spirit in that person. But it's also exciting because you could be the one that fuels their faith, that is the catalyst of them experiencing the transforming love of Jesus Christ. So that's exciting. And it's a reminder that you have power. It might not be the power you think you want to have, the power of being right, but you have a different kind of power that changes lives. See, there are some people that in their hearts, right, they're just waiting for Christians to be judgmental. And they're like, that's right, Christians only like to be right. But they need somebody that says, Christians love, so Jesus loves. This Christian cares, so Jesus cares. That's what we want to do. We want to feel their faith. Do I love the person more than I love my opinion? Do I love the person more than I love my opinion? Now, I don't know why when I think of opinions, I think of this. You can laugh all day. But I used to have, like, a whole slew of stuffed animals. Little, cushy, cute, fluffy stuffed animals. And we have one in here, actually. You want to hold your little little birdie up for me? (laughs) Nicole, she's like, she has a birdie. Okay. Um, Little fun fact about Amy. I used to be scared that my stuffed animals could come alive and and get me, so I would shove them under the bed at night. Um, And when I went to sleep, I'd be scared. That's so dumb, I know. But think about these stuffed animals. They're warm, they're fuzzy, they're cuddly. We want to hold on to them. Those are like our opinions. We like, oh, but I like my opinion. I like it so much. It's so cute. I'm going to pet it. But God's like, when you were young, you had things like when you were young. But now that you're older and you're mature, I want you to grow out of those things. And so sometimes we got to choose to let go of our warm, fuzzy, cuddly opinions that make us feel good about ourselves in order to bring somebody to Christ. To minister to them. See, we've got to pray and obey and find out what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about how you can feed their faith because He knows best. And so when you're listening, man, you don't know what the Lord is going to speak to you to fuel their fire. Maybe He says, just listen. Maybe God wants you to have a kind word. Maybe He wants to use you in the gifts of the Spirit. How radical, amazing would that be with the gifts of the Spirit were outside of the church? And we saw words of knowledge, a word of prophecy spoken. Or maybe God just wants to get you to give them an encouraging scripture. And I'm just going to pause right here and say, it is the sword of the spirit. The word of the Lord is the sword of the spirit. And you can use it to cut somebody just as much as you can use it to help someone. But the goal is not to cut them and to prove your point. The goal is to cut something off of them. So wield the sword, which is the word of God. Wield it wisely and respectfully. That's just a side note right there. Maybe God wants you to remind them that they are loved. Maybe he wants you to pray for them. Maybe he wants you to give them a hug. Who knows what the Spirit could do through you? I just know personally that I took a few steps for myself with this woman that God had laid on my my heart about a year ago, the Lord told me to prophesy over a girl that wasn't saved and to just kind of go for it. God was just downloading how much he loved her, what he wanted to do in her life. And so, man, I took a leap of faith and I, t- I hit send on a prophetic word to, to a girl that's not a believer. I was like scared to death. And she was like, oh, thanks. That's nice. Like after two days, I was like, okay. <laughs> but the Lord was like, I love this girl. I love her. I want to do things in her. I want to do things through her. And he just kept revealing all these things to me. I'm like, but God, she didn't really like my prophecy that much. And what happened is he was like, I want you to pray every day for her. I want you to pray every day for her salvation. This was a year ago. Every day she's been on my mirror. I write names on my mirror in uh, not chalk, but, you know, dry erase marker, that. She's on my mirror to pray for every day. And, you know, just two months ago, she started posting things about crystals and psychic stuff and tarot cards. And my heart just sank. And it wasn't just that, but then I started to obsess about it. And I was like, oh, man, i got to tell her she's wrong. Because clearly, and this is true, what she's doing is wrong and it opens the door to the demonic. 
in my heart, I was like, I got to tell her. How am I going to tell her? How is that going to go when I finally tell her she's, she's wrong? Because, man, I'm totally justified in telling her she's wrong. And the Holy Spirit was like, hold your horses, little powerhouse, and your tongue, and your typing. And he's like, I want you to relate with her and use her verbiage. I've never done this before. This is new to me to, with this stuff because I'm like, oh, is that kind of blasphemy, God? If I'm like, I don't know. He's like, no, she's sensitive in the spiritual realm, and that's what your focus is. And so I took my time, I, I messaged her back, and I said, I want you to know that I, too, have these similar giftings. And I said, I see the future, and I hear some things that have happened in the past. I didn't even tell her where I got it from. Boom, my inbox explodes with messages from her. I've never heard of anybody else that has this before. Can you tell me? How did you get it? Um, where did it come from? How do you operate in it? Are you afraid to operate? I mean, she's just questions, questions, questions. I start answering her questions, and finally the Spirit releases me to say, hey, I want you to tell her these came from when you accepted me in your heart, and the Holy Spirit began to give you these things. So then I, I message her, and I'm like, hey, the Holy Spirit started giving me these things, and this really comes from Jesus, and her instant response is, I'm not really for the church or religion it's hurt so many people uh, and the Holy Spirit just kept giving me things I was like you know what maybe the church has but Jesus loves you and Jesus is love and I want to encourage you to explore the man of Jesus Christ and so she didn't end up going to this big gathering that we had where I was going to meet with her um, she wanted to do a reading on me <laughs> and I was like oh thank God I didn't go because <laughs> I feel like I would need to pray a lot but I'm telling you guys I had a choice in that moment that I could tell her she's wrong and become a stumbling block or I could share with her and fuel the faith that she already had and take the oil in my bucket and apply the Holy Spirit and watch her faith grow. And you guys, two weeks ago, maybe even a week and a half ago, she posted this incredible post. She's like, I have to be vulnerable. And I posted it on our Facebook page. You can go see it. I have to be vulnerable. I have become a Jesus follower. A year I've been praying for this girl. She's like, I have become a Jesus follower. I ran from the church for years. I thought it wasn't worth anything, but I see the person Jesus and I'm drawn to him, is what she said. And there are two things that I think I had a choice. And I know so many people were playing from her for her. It wasn't just me, but I had a choice. I could put her faith out or I could fuel it. And I thank you, God, that you let me be a part of fueling it and not putting it out and not becoming a stumbling block to her salvation, that I got to be a part of something that was so much bigger than myself. And it was such a blessing, and it's so powerful. Guys, that's what God has for you. That's what God wants to do with you when we are not fighting the flesh, but we're feeding their spirit. And Jesus and his Holy Spirit is free to do his work because, man, he needs to do his work because number three is this, let Jesus do his work. You do your work, which is to love and to listen and, and to basically pray and obey, right, and feed their faith, and you let him do his work. Honey, come in for a second. Lean in real nice. When you do the work of conviction, it only comes out as condemnation. Your job is not conviction. That is the Holy Spirit's job. And when we touch God's job, we become a stumbling block to the weak. Don't touch God's job. It is the Spirit's job to convict unto righteousness. John 16, 8 and when he comes, and I'm not reading the full context of this, but this is Jesus who's saying, when I ascend to heaven after, uh, when, after his resurrection, when I ascend to heaven, the Holy Spirit's going to come. He's saying, when he comes, he will expose sin and prove the world is wrong. But it's not our job to prove the world is wrong. He will prove the world is wrong about God's righteousness and judgment. But man, sometimes God just takes too long for me. I mean, he's got to hurry it up. I don't know about you, but I'm like, oh, there's this thing tomorrow that they're going to be at, and then they're going to make this choice and that choice, and God, I just need you to hurry it up, and you're not hurrying it up, so I'm going to need to tell them. And it comes down to this, a trust issue. This trust issue, do you trust God to save them? 
Or do we take that into our own hands? And it is a temptation. Let me tell you. I mean, if I'm the only one in here that's been tempted to do God's job, I don't know if I'm safe in here. (laughs) I'm sure some of you have been tempted. But when we step in and do God's job, it makes things longer. It prolongs them. It hinders things. And you know what? It just sucks. That's when I'm exhausted. I've got anxiety. I'm tired. I'm worn out. Ministry is a burden because I'm doing God's job. But Jesus' job that he has for me, his burden is light. But when I let him do his job and I do my job, woo, we in tandem, and it's fire. It's enjoyable. I love life. And so I want to encourage you, even in your own life, don't do God's job. Let the Holy Spirit do his job. And do we trust him enough to do his job? And we should consider the example that Jesus set for us in Philippians, the first one, that the, first, the scripture I read for you before John, Philippians 2, 3, and 5. And I'm going to quote to you the NIV version. Jesus, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he made himself nothing, taking on the very likeness of a servant, becoming obedient even to death, a shameful death, death on a cross. Man, if Jesus, the most right, righteous human being on the world, in the world, could take on the shame of the world, I certainly could hold my tongue and hold back my opinion. Man, he sets this incredible example. What if my opinion is never heard, but the love of Jesus in me is heard? How powerful could that be? How much more rewarding could it be to be a part of somebody's life transformation rather than being right? Being right feels good, but it also feels kind of icky, like, uh uh-oh, I need to, like, wipe that off. But being a part of somebody's life transformation, that's going to feel good forever, for a real long time. That is nourishing. And this could, man, I'm going to say something that could be a sermon all on its very onesie, on its very own, how much more rewarding is it to lay down my opinion to guard the unity of the body of Christ so that she can move forward advancing the kingdom? I'm not talking about not addressing unethical or immoral um, things, but, man, sometimes we just need to lay down our opinion, our preferences, so that the body of Christ can be united in advancing the kingdom of God. What an honor to be a part of such a movement that loves different, that really genuinely loves the way that Jesus loved. I don't know about you guys, but I am, like, obsessed with The Chosen. Like, I watch it all the time. (laughs) I'm, like, constantly watching it. It's become my new pride and prejudice. And if you don't know me, you don't know this. But, like, when I'm cleaning the house or when I'm sick, I play Pride and Prejudice like five times a day. It just plays in the background of my life. Now Chosen has become that. But I love the Chosen for this reason. I love how when the disciples come to him, they're like, we're going to Samaria? Oh my gosh, we don't do that. We're Jews. No, 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 Jesus. And he looks at them and he says, well, we do things differently. And I can kind of hear Jesus even speaking that to me when I'm like, whoa, 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 Jesus, that doesn't fit in my religious legalistic box. And Jesus is like, Amy, we do things differently. We love different. We do things differently. It's revolutionary, isn't it? He changed the world with the way he loved different. He changed my life. He turned things upside down, and that's the kind of love I want to be a part of. It's the kind of church I want to be a part of, one that loves differently. So I'll ask you again, is it better to have a right heart or to be right? And man, that can encompass so many things from the gifts of the Spirit to preaching all of those things. I'm going to tell you right now, it's always, always better to have a right heart because we might get to heaven and find out we were wrong about a whole lot of stuff. And so if I'm wrong, I just want to have a right heart about it. One that surrendered to God, open to his correction. But we all have the problem of haughty eyes. We just do, because we just like that. We like feeling good about ourselves. We need to listen and love. We need to feed their faith. We need to let the Holy Spirit do his job. And I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to have lots of opportunities starting this week, starting tomorrow. Maybe when you go home and there's a post 
in Facebook or Instagram and you're like, whoop, there's an opportunity for me to listen and love and hold my tongue. You're going to have a lot of opportunities. Can I challenge you to do them? To take that step? Can I challenge you to walk in this, to experience it, to grow your muscle? There is grace for you when you fail. But don't not try and listen and love. I'm going to have you guys stand for a moment. We're going to make a declaration that is scriptural as we come to a close. But I want to encourage you, if you have not experienced this love yet, you haven't given Jesus your life and let him turn it around and transform it, deliver you, set you free, and know this love, I'm going to give you an opportunity after we make this declaration to accept Jesus in your heart. But I'd love for all of us to stand and make this declaration together. It's scripture. Because Jesus died on the cross for you, he has made you righteous and he is holy and he's made you holy and his love dwells inside of you. And so you have the ability to do all the things that I'm saying and have the love that I'm talking about through Jesus. You can't do it on your own. You have to do it with Jesus. But I want to declare over you, you are kind. You are good. You are loving because that's who you are, and that way we operate not out of what we should do, which is shame, but we operate out of our identity, which is who we are. Sons and daughters, co-heirs with Christ of this love that we're talking about. So would you repeat this after me? This is based off Philippians 2. I choose to be incredibly patient. I will be gentle and consistently kind. I refuse to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. I won't brag about my achievements, nor inflate my own importance. I will not traffic in shame and disrespect, nor selfishly seek my own honor. I will not be easily irritated or quick to take offense. I will joyfully celebrate honesty and find no delight in wrong. I will be a safe place of shelter for I will never stop believing the best for others. I won't take failure as defeat nor will I ever give up. I will never stop loving. The love of God is in me. The love of God in me will extend beyond the gift of prophecy, which eventually fades. It is more enduring than tongues, which will one day fall silent. His love through me remains long after words of knowledge are forgotten. Why don't you close your eyes? Jesus, we accept your forgiveness for the times that we have not been loving. The times that we put our opinion before others. The times that we've loved our opinion better than others. God, we recognize, Jesus, that you have grace for us. We don't need to walk in shame. The old is gone. The new has come. And God, through your love and your power, we are going to show the world what it means to love different. That I don't need to work or to strive to do these things just to relax in your love, to let you do your job. I'm going to see amazing things happen through me. And I just want to receive your love right now and your grace so that I can be a part of giving that out. For those of you that you've never accepted Jesus in your heart or you're like, I gotta come back to this love, would you just, you don't have to repeat after me, but would you just pray this prayer in your heart? Jesus, I recognize that you came to this earth and you showed this earth a different kind of love. That you died on the cross for me even if I was the only one, and you, but you rose from the dead giving me power over sin, over hell, over death, over the grave, and that you sent your Holy Spirit to dwell in me so that I could do all the things that you did on earth. 
And so I invite you, Jesus, to come into my life, to transform me by this incredible love that Pastor Amy's talking about and to be Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.